Uh, first of all, let me start by saying thank you to IMAX for letting us do this here. Uh, the best way to watch a movie. I'm not just saying that. I actually love the format. It's not just me, uh, you know, BSing. Um, uh, that's number one. Number two, I'm going to do some questions, but eventually I'm going to open it up to you guys. Uh, the only favor I ask when you guys are uh, asking questions, uh, please, no spoilers. Uh, I know you're going to be tempted to talk about Civil War, possibly Avengers, or possibly other things, but I beg of you, no spoilers, because uh, some people in here know a lot, and a lot of people know very little, myself included. So uh, we want to keep it spoiler free, especially because we're recording it. It's going to be on the internet. We just want to be cool. Uh, and just to keep it so everyone does spoiler free, we're going to be doing a lot more of these screenings. They could be back in the future. And if anyone asks anything that's a spoiler, I will totally remember you. And I will personally <laughs> make sure you cannot come back in. So I promise you we're going to be announcing a great February screening and so on and so forth. So please, no spoilers. I hope I appreciate you putting up with the vent, the uh, rant. Uh, jumping in, I, I had a whole bunch of questions, but I, I really have to start with uh, the, how did you learn how to play a doctor? <laughs> it was very difficult. Um, uh, several months at a hospital. Uh, no, I don't know. Um, Consulted with Ken Jong. Yes. <laughs> we actually, I, as, I was actually wearing a mustache during the surgery scene, and I take the mask off very briefly. Uh, and uh, nobody liked the mustache, so we ended up painting it off in, with VFX and post. <laughs> and I played the second scene without the mustache, so uh, little tidbit. Uh, y you guys get along so great, and every time I've talked to you or seen you, you guys are just always smiling and so happy. I really want to know about the fights on set. Uh, when, when did you guys fight, and did you fight over anything in the movie? It's usually like pepperoni or sausage or <laughs> Where the big sushi. fight on this one was, should Fury die or not? Remember that? We're gonna, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> uh, that was never a fight. Uh, he was always going to die. <laughs> uh, I don't know. They're here, small. They're small. Here, and they're usually the, the only fight I can think about, again, we don't really, I, I don't, we haven't fought in a long time. Although, <laughs> you know, when we grew up, we fought hard, but... Um, you know, I think I remember us just getting in conversations like when Cap sneaks into his apartment when Fury's there, like, you know, where's Cap's shield? You know, like, where would Cap leave his shield? You know, Is would it he be the in the bathroom? hallway? In the bed? Yeah, it's like, probably. does not. he have a special place for it in his study? Yeah, put you know, it over his bed? It's a little weird. I think we got hung up on that for too long. <laughs> you guys got to wor work with Robert Redford, and I know you've probably told story after story about working with him, but let's share a good one here. Uh, is there one good one from behind the scenes, just even geeking out with him? Or? I mean, I thought, that, I thought the most interesting story was that when we first met with Redford, he cooked for us. Uh, and it was incredible salmon, by the way. But uh, um, I thought it was so strange that this icon uh, uh, would, was cooking for us and uh, literally we sat and had lunch and ate his meal. And it was fantastic and, and had a conversation with him. But he, I think it was his, his way of, you know, Breaking bre bread and making sure that he was comfortable with us, and um, I'm sure he uh, he wanted to see if we liked his food. Uh, <laughs> but uh, he, everything about him was um, very uh, uh, low-fi and low-maintenance. Uh, he was the kind of actor who, again, you have to remember his age here, would uh, sit in a chair. W so we would sit in our director's chairs, and the monitors would be here. Redford would sit where you sat. And he would take it, he had a New York Times on there. He would take the New York Times and he would read it in between setups. And when we were ready, we'd just say, Bob, we're ready. He'd fold up his New York Times, he'd put it on his chair. He'd go in and he'd act. And then he'd come back out and he'd sit down in his chair and he'd read the New York Times until we were ready for him again. And he stayed on set all day long, which is never the case. Uh, you know, he was always on time, always ready to go. And I just thought that that spoke to a, uh, another time in filmmaking. You know, very... Uh, uh, a, a time of uh, of um, uh, discipline. It's just yeah. a very fo it's a very yes. focused work ethic. Hold on, we need some applause. Here. Yeah, I was going to be like, wait yeah. a minute. <laughs> Eventually, you guys will we'll get that later on camera. Yeah. And I mean, we can go on and on about Redford. I mean, he, he's an amazing thing. He, he just looms so large for us as a as a figure, not just as an actor, but. 
you know, just, be, you know, we're, we're two guys that found our way from a million of miles away from the film industry in Cleveland, you know, in, into the business through, you, we didn't go to Sundance, but we went to like this sort of little upstart festival rival of it, Slam Dance that runs concurrently. And it's like that, you know, if that road didn't exist, which he, Redford started, you know, that's, that's how we found our way. You know, we brought a little movie that we made on credit cards there, and that was what started it all for us. So I don't know. He's just a very he, enormous figure. I think, I remember this other thing he said to us when first time we, one of the first times we said, no, it was the first time, yeah, he said, he said, guys, I have to be honest with you. He goes, I don't know what these movies are, <laughs> but my grandkids love them. So that was like the opener, you know, and it was, he was very honest. And, and you forget, like Joe was saying, how what was sort of lo fi and traditional. I mean, he, he's never done a movie like this. I mean, he's like, hasn't even really worked with green screen. That's how, that's how traditional the sort of filmmaking school he comes from is. And I remember the first day we shot, we were in Nick Fury's office. It's a scene where he talks to Cap, interrogates Cap. And he was just standing at the window, and this was a built set on a stage. And he's looking out the window and everything outside, it's just surrounded with green out there because we're going to put DC. And he's just standing there looking at the green, checking it out like it's kind of new and interesting to him. And I was standing next to him and said, okay, Bob, so you know when this is done, this is going to be DC all out here. And he just goes, really? I thought it was Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> he's just kind of cl cool, classy, understated guy. One of, my, one of my favorite things about this movie is, uh, and I, I mentioned this to you in a, in a previous conversation, every movie has to have exposition, and it's about how you deliver the exposition that can make or break a film. Uh, when it's done poorly, it just takes everyone out of the story. My favorite thing in this movie is the exposition in the bunker scene, where they, they have to be interested enough to not question what's going on, and it's, it's just an amazing use of exposition. If you could talk about that scene, and also just getting a great scene like that, and if you could explain exposition for maybe anyone who doesn't, you know what I mean. Exposition is plot. It's this dialogue that the characters have to speak to move the story forward. Um, we hate bald exposition. We work very hard. Uh, Marcus and Kefili work incredibly hard uh, to make sure that, that the exposition is seamless, but also that it's motivated and that the characters have stakes, emotion, uh, um, uh, or reason um, uh, to say the exposition that, uh, that goes beyond just moving the story forward. So that scene in the bunker there's incredible stakes involved in it. You know, it's Fury's fighting for S.H.I.E.L.D. and Cap's fighting to bring down S.H.I.E.L.D. Um, uh, you know, um, Natasha's a little upset with Fury because uh, he faked his death and she went through a very, uh, uh, you know, a, a strong, uh, uh, she had a very strong emotional response to that. I think you mean Zola. Though. Oh, I'm, I mean, mean I'm, are you yeah, talking I mean, about Zola? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Zola. I, I apologize. I mean, it should have been more clear. Yeah, yeah. that, yeah. that yeah. Zola scene, that yeah. exposition's I mean, really bald. We, we were, look, at, we were terrified of that scene in a lot of ways because we love the scene. We love the idea of Zola in the scene. But we were terrified in the sense because he's basically got to give Cap this enormous explanation about Hydra and it's just like a huge monologue of exposition, like you're saying. So yeah, I think I remember when we were struggling with it, because we, we, we break out in a, in a rash with exposition. We like, to, so we like layered filmmaking, we like when everything's hidden. A lot, of, a lot of the process we go through when we develop a script is like anytime we get, to, we, we like to sit around in a room with Marcus and McFeely and just read the script out loud. We'll do that like several times through the process of development. And they're awesome writers, but it's like these stories are complicated and they have very specific plots that you need to like make sure everybody's understanding what's going on. And so anytime we get to like sections of dialogue that feel exp expository, we just go, okay, let's just cut these lines and see what happens. And then a lot of times what happens is you need what you threw out in those lines in order for the story to make sense. So then that forces you to figure out, well, how do we put it back in the story in a way that's a little more uh, organic or, or more hidden uh, than just sort of bald exposition as you go through? Well, the whole trick of the scene with Zola, obviously, is that the, the exposition is a distraction uh, to keep Cap and Natasha from noticing that there is a missile headed for them. So it's a twist, right? So it's a trick. So he has to say something that is attention-grabbing to Cap that he knows will pull his focus, which is, your, you know, your life was a failure, uh, which I think would distract anyone. Um, and, and that's how we are able to, you know, dump two minutes of information on you and backstory about Hydra. Uh, but it also is revelatory, right? The scene, the scene is um, uh, it's meant to be a shocking scene uh, because it takes something um, 
you know, the audience uh, knew to be true for several movies and it flipped it on its head. So again, I think that was another way we were able to hide the exposition in that scene because as you're watching it, you're as shocked as Cap is. Um, so I think uh, uh, that, that, was, uh, and that was a long debated scene about how we were going to make all that work and, and we finally came up with the conceit of the missile and that really was finally how we were able to solve the problem of, of the exposition. Uh, this movie has fantastic action and the action set pieces, they just keep on getting better and better. How much are you, talk a little bit about the previs and working with second unit and making these action set pieces really stand out on their own compared to other Marvel movies and other movies in general. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a really involved process. It takes months and months of prep for those sequences. I mean, we, what we do in the process of development is we'll start sitting down with um, our visual effects team, our special effects team, our stunt team, et cetera, our storyboard artists, our pre-visualization team. These are all sort of people that contribute to figuring out how to execute and stage these things with us. And we'll just start running through, we'll, Joe and I will sort of pitch out a form of what we want to do in a particular action sequence. And then people will sort of take runs at it in their various ways. Some people, the previs people, will make up animated versions of the sequence and show it to us. You know, the storyboard artists will do it in drawings. Um, you know, our stunt, our stunt uh, team will go out and shoot demos of the fight, you know, according to the format that we've laid out. On iPhones, and, you know, it's very sort of a rough sketch of what the fight will be. Yeah, exactly. And so it's so, so it's, you have a huge, I mean, it's, there's a reason why those credits are so long. You know, it's like <laughs> it takes an enormous amount of people to make these movies. So, um, and then what we'll, we'll go through several iterations. We'll just keep refining it over the months and months of pre-production uh, until we get to the set. Because, you know, again, these movies are so expensive to shoot. By the time you get to the point of execution where you're on set, and all the money's flying out the door because of all the equipment and the, the locations and the sets and all that, you have to be very precise in what you want to get and what you want to bring into the edit room. So be, being very well prepped on sequences like that is critical because they're super expensive to shoot. You can't waste time or resources. You guys uh, did a fantastic job on this. Um, I'm very curious what you took away from the, cr the critical and commercial success of this film into Civil War. You know, did you, I'm sure you guys were listening to what people said, and I'm just curious what mentally you were like, oh, we got to do this, or we learned that, and we wanted to apply it. Well, it's interesting, you know, a couple things to say about that question. One is, yes, we do listen to people, and we have since the, since Arrested Development. We, we've, uh, you know, I'll check it on the message boards every few days, because I find great ideas in the message boards. There's a lot of very clever fans out there. There's some crazy ones, but there's a lot of very... <laughs> clever fans out there who are very passionate about the material and you, you, you know they, they remind you of things. We, we were doing community, I was on a message board and, and um, somebody was shipping Jeff and Annie and I went, Jeff and Annie, why would somebody ship Jeff and Annie? And this was very early in season one. And I went, oh my God, that's a great fucking idea. <laughs> um, and then episode nine, we started a relationship between Jeff and Annie. Uh, uh, rest of development was like the er, you know the early early phases of this was 2000s so the early phases of message boards, and uh, it was a very cultivated uh, message board on television without pity that we used to go to all the time, and um, and uh, and we got great ideas from the fans for that show and we realized how much they loved the call forwards and the callbacks and we started you know using them more and which characters were popping for them and, and why other characters weren't popping so it's a little bit like a test audience for us. So we do listen to people. Uh, um, secondly, there's another part of your question that was really good, and I was. What did you learn making this? Uh, what, do, what do we learn on this one? Commercially yeah. Pitching, yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the doing serialized storytelling is very complicated, um, especially in film, and especially with Marvel because there are so many movies. Uh, and the trick with these films is they can start to fall into the same structural pattern. Uh, so what we knew we had to do on Civil War was to deconstruct the pattern. Um, so it's, uh, uh, it's really, um, you know, it's, it's a curveball. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, that's what we learned from this movie, which is very traditionally structured, and the third act is extremely traditional. It's an adventure film. You know, we used to remark that, you know, it's, it's the, you know, um, it's the Dirty Dozen, right? It's the... You know, Jim Brown has got to get the grenade and the chimney pipe before the Nazis get out of the room or they're going to lose, and, you know. Uh, and so he's got to make that run, 
you know, it's the same thing. Cap has got to get that grenade in the chimney pipe, which is basically put the card in the uh, in the slot. So it's a it's a way to like literal, literalize action, but on a very traditional level. Um, and I think civil war is non-traditional. And so I think that's what we learned from this movie was that we can't keep um, uh, executing the same formula because it, it grows tiresome. I mean, yeah, like the movie worked. So next time out, you can't do the same thing. You know what I mean? You have to do something. You have to find something else that works. And that's sort of our pattern, you know. Uh, it does seem like Civil War could get darker. And Marvel movies traditionally have some good humor. Talk a little bit about, um, are you guys balancing the same kind of thing where it's, you know, a lot of humor mixed in? Or is it a lot darker of a movie? You know, it is, look, at it, it, it's, it, it's a dark, you know, we, we, we refer to, you know, we, this movie, of course, Winter Soldier was a political thriller. And we think of... Civil War is a psychological thriller. It's a complicated movie, and it yes, it's it, it sort of it divides these people that you've known to be coming to not to only to be a team, but like Cap and Natasha in this movie, they're sort of evolving into more of a surrogate family for each other. You know, so it's a it's an it's a close group of people that's being divided. So that's a difficult thing to do. But there is there's a good there's a good portion of the movie that's actually much funnier than Winter Soldier because there are characters in that film who are funnier who come from worlds where, you know, the tone is more comedic. You're not uh, talking about Spider-Man. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. Am I? Uh, I mean, that, but that is what he's talk, I'm talking about, is the idea that, like, not everybody is invested, not all the characters in that movie have the same history as the Avengers. They're coming, they're coming at the problem of the film, sort of, like, not, not embedded with all if, that baggage. If this is the emotional core of the movie, some of the characters are right around that emotional core. Some of them are out here because they're not tied to uh, the, the, the central arc of the movie with the same uh, motivation as, as, as some of the other characters. So they can be lighter. And I think that uh, there are a lot lighter moments in it, but beca because there are much darker moments in the movie as well. So you do, that is how you balance out the film, and we did have to work very hard to balance it. Um, when you found out, by the way, I really appreciate them answering uh, Civil War questions. Um, <laughs> when you found out you were gonna get to be able to play with Spidey, uh, did you, what was the first thing you did? Did you do cartwheels in the parking lot? Or was it, I mean, you're just like, you know, screaming in the office? It was a very long, long, long process. You know, we were, it was a, th it was a the kind of thing we had a lobby for, right, for months. So, and what happens is like during a long process like that where you're lobbying for months is, you know, you're continuing to develop the movie and the character. And so it, during the time that it takes you to convince the powers that be, to like make make the jump and do that, like you've you've in, you've ingrained the character so deeply at that point into the story that like you'd have to destroy the story to take him out. So, by the I would say this: by the time you fi we found out that this, that he was in the movie, it wasn't so much a elation as it was like, oh thank God, because we'd have to <laughs> blow the whole movie up with uh, if we didn't get this, you know. So and I'm a comic book fan. I'm a comic book collector. I've been since I was a kid. He was my favorite character as a kid, so the opportunity to work with that character. And to get a chance to reinvent the character, and more specifically, and we've been very candid about this, you know, I, you know for me, I really wanted to see uh, 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 somebody cast who was very close to a high schooler's age because that was, was what was so valuable to me about the character when I was a kid is that he's a high schooler with this power and responsibility and it, and it makes him very distinct as a hero. It makes him very distinct from the other characters in the Marvel Universe who are confident, experienced superheroes. Um, and it was super important uh, to have that uh, um, color in the movie. Uh, and, uh, and so we, you know, we felt it was, it was invaluable and, and, and we do think that it, it does go a long way. That character helps us balance out the tone of the movie. Where are you right now in the editing process? In we hell. Are, yeah. We're, what's that? In hell. In hell. <laughs> in hell. Yeah. Can you tell? Uh, we, yeah, we, we, we're sort of like, the next month is probably like the hardest part of the editing process because we're right at the point where we are, I would say in about a month from now, we'll be like what's called locking picture, you know? So the movie will be kind of set in stone at that point. We'll still have visual effects to work on for another six weeks or so after that point, but... Um, We're actually joking. It's probably, this has been the easiest post-process we've ever had on a film. It, you know, we're very happy with where the movie was. Everyone is very happy with where, where the movie was uh, or is. 
Um, and you know, it's uh, you know, for us, the tricky thing is the VFX because it's a very complicated movie, and there are some really big sequences in the film. Uh, and there's there's VFX on a much larger scale than than, than the work that we did in um, in Winter Soldier. So that's the part that becomes really difficult because you got to dig in, and you don't have a lot of time. And our standards are high, and everybody w works w on the movie that has has really high standards, and so everybody starts killing themselves at this point. Um, we're finishing up the music. Henry Jackman is back. The score. Really good. We're really happy with the score. He leaves to go to London in two weeks, and then we we do some uh, quick uh, reshoots next week, which are very traditional on Marvel films, and also we're very traditional on our TV shows, from Arrested to Community to Happy Endings. We were constantly tweaking and fixing, and you know, there's always a shot you could do better or uh, a moment that you feel like you can use to clarify. So we have like a couple days of pickups to do, and and then you know we'll be done with the movie in about two and a half months. Have you already filmed your uh, post credit scene? <laughs> <laughs> Had to ask. Okay, so uh, moving on, for the people that don't realize, uh, these gentlemen are going to be directing the next two Avengers movies. Um, so it's never too early to ask questions about that. And I, I want to start with, uh, over the weekend, I think you were in New Orleans, and it came out that one of you said, I, I forget who, uh, that, that you were talking with 67 characters, or a huge number for the movies. Um, you want to uh, sort of, was that an accurate thing? Well, no, I think I, I should clarify it because I misspoke. It's actually 68 characters. <laughs> so I want to clear that up. <laughs> I mean, he was being figurative when he said that number, and I, I think somebody took it as literal, but there's a lot of characters. So, um, but look, the, 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 the Inf Infinity War is meant to be the culmination of the entire Marvel Cinematic Universe up to that moment. So it is, it's a very ambitious in its scope. It wants to sort of take, take everything that you've seen before and sort of coalesce it into some kind of climactic ending. Um, so like that's... you're doing that answer. Yeah. That was good. <laughs> So anyway, yeah, there is, it's, it's, a, it's, a comp it's complicated, ambitious storytelling. Do you, I mean, being serious for a second, are you really talking about over 50 characters in the movies? We're talking about a lot of characters, two films, and these are huge scale movies, and a lot of intersection is happening in these films. And so, it's, um, you know, we're not talking about lead characters, we're just talking about people who make an appearance in the movie. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, these are... You know, Thanos has a very large agenda. These are, you know, this, uh, these are big movies, uh, and um, uh, you know, so it's uh, it's it's of a scope that uh, that you know um, that I think everybody wants to see in these films, and and that is demanded of of the title Infinity War. I'm going to ask you some questions that I hopefully you can answer that are not going to spoil anything. You all know how I feel about spoilers. Uh, where and when are you filming them? Start shooting both of them later this year uh, in November, and we're primarily going to be based in Atlanta again, like we were for Civil War. Although we'll, that's sort of where we do our stage work, some exteriors, and then there'll be other locations around the world involved as well. Um, and it's going to take. I mean, we actually leave. Do we actually relocate to Atlanta in uh, late July? We we'll finish pre-production there, and I don't think we're we don't come back to Los Angeles until the following June. So it's a, it's a long run, so. So you're filming both like back to back? Yeah, we're gonna shoot both Yeah, I mean, we shoot them concurrently, meaning that some days we'll be doing the first movie, some days we'll be doing the second movie. You just jump back and forth. <laughs> that, I mean, yeah. that is a daunting, daunting shoot. Yeah, yeah we won't look like this next year. <laughs> Uh, have to ask, where are you in the scripting process? Are you close to a finished script? We have two excellent outlines from Marcus and McFeely for the films, and they, they just, yeah, to their great credit. I mean, these are incredibly hard stories to wrangle, as you can imagine. And uh, they just went off and started writing the first draft of the first movie. Who is uh, your cinematographer? Do you have one? Trent. Trent Oplock, who has shot all of our films. Yeah. I like the way we're going. Uh, my, my last thing before I open it up to uh, the audience. Uh, Marvel has been kicking ass on Netflix. And obviously we're all wondering, um, Jessica Jones, like all these characters that are emerging are doing such a great job. Is there, in the 68 characters you've been talking about, has there been any talk about 
cameos, Easter eggs, or full-fledged appearances? I mean, all things are possible at Marvel. We'll just say that. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that answer. Um, we'll, we'll find Listen, out Listen, working soon. for Marvel, you become a master at saying absolutely nothing. <laughs> I understand. Oh, actually, one thing, though. Um, we're here at IMAX. We obviously just showed uh, Winter Soldier in IMAX, and you're going to be shooting the Avengers movies, if I'm not mistaken, with IMAX cameras. That's right, start to finish. So yeah. talk a little bit about the camera you chose to use and why this IMAX Theory camera. It's 65, and, uh, you know, it, 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 it's got a really large chip. It's a beautiful chip on it. Um, uh, we love the facility of the camera. It's a gorgeous image. And this is parts of the Revenant shot on it, if not the whole thing, but not... In the, in the uh, IMAX aspect ratio, um, and uh, it's just, so it's just got it, it can hold an incredible amount of information, which is great for special effects because we can get higher quality effects. It's better for you when you have you know good equipment at home and you want to watch it in higher resolution. Uh, and it's amazing to sit in here and watch it from top to bottom aspect ratio. So remember what you just watched here. You know the top and the bottom are cut off because it's two four, uh, and this is a much taller uh, uh, aspect ratio. So uh, it just works for the style of characters that we're dealing with. You know? Cool. Um, we're now going to open it up to people in the audience. I'm assuming people have uh, hands will raise. Okay, hi. <laughs> <laughs> just want to make sure. Uh, I'm Terrence. Uh, I'm a film school student at Loyola Marymount uh, right up the road. And I wanted to ask a question about, you talked a lot about you know these big action set pieces, but how do you make sure to also balance like character um, and character beats within the action so well? Because that's one of my favorite parts of this movie. <laughs> Well, for, for us, the, the you know, character beats are primary, right? The action is secondary. Uh, but also, you, you know, we also feel as part and parcel with having good action is that the action has to turn on character. And uh, if it doesn't, it gets boring really quickly. Uh, and you can chart that whole Fury car chase on how Fury responds to everything that happens in the sequence and, and how it turns on his character. Uh, and it's jeopardy for him. Um, uh, you know, and I think, you know, f the first thing that we do is we break the story of the script. Uh, and then we spend a lot of time in the room uh, with Marcus and McFeely combing through the script. And when I say a lot of time, I mean two, three, four months. We're in the room every day for eight or nine hours just going through the script, talking through all the character <coughs> beats. Have we hit every character? What can we do to help this character here? Is this the right arc for this character? Uh, it's not until we're finished with that work that, that we then begin work on the action sequences. So you have to layer in the character first, you have to understand the ending, you have to have the emotional arc of the movie, then you can build the action set pieces around what's happening with the characters, and then you know how uh, the action needs to, how the characters need to respond to the action to move their story forward. Uh, next question, uh, right there. Hi, um, thank you for being here, this is really pretty cool. Um, I'm really curious about your collaboration with Marcus and McFeely, because there's so much that is happening in these stories from the broad strokes down to the finest details. And I want to know about your collaboration and how you and the writers work together, like who brings the story and how do you achieve that? It's kind of, you know, look, there. we love them. I mean, look, my brother and I are highly collaborative. We work as a team, you know, we, we enjoy the process of collaboration. Same with Marcus and McFeely, they're, gr they're great collaborators. So, you know, sort of like coming together with them, we just, we work very, very well with them. We have a very easy process with them. They're very, and I think, I think we both enjoy, I mean, it's basically what Joe just described is what the process is, is like, we, we sort of bat stuff back and forth with them a lot, you know, whether it be in the development process before anything's written down, just talking story for months and months, and then that turn, then they start putting pen to paper, and that turn, maybe it'll turn into outlines, and then we'll bat those around for a long time, and, uh, heat it up and just go through the exact process Joe, Joe just did, Joe just described. But we, you know, we sort of talk, you know, we love ensemble storytelling. So we like to talk through the, through the story from everybody's point of view. You know, we'll take a turn. Even in the Cap movies, you know, we really think about when they're centered on Cap, they are Cap sort of driving the story beginning to end. But we like to like sort of take moments where we're walking all the other important characters through beginning to end in our minds on a storytelling level and just seeing how they how we shape them through the story, where they begin, where how how can we sort of make their arc more exciting or surprising or or challenging, and uh, um, so I think it's just you know that's really it. Then they'll, you know they'll go to drafts and then we'll sort of we'll do the same thing with the drafts. We'll you will know, we'll talk about them in the macro sense in terms of where everything is moving, beginning and the end of the story, 
And then we'll do a lot of micro work where we'll just sit down and sometimes we spend a few days just on a single scene, just going over it and over it, trying to figure out, you know, where, how can we beat it? You know, what else can we try in the scene that we weren't thinking of? It's a very, a very thorough process of just spitballing creative ideas to each other, either verbally or on paper or whatever the case may be, um, and just finding something that excites us all. Next question. Uh, let's go right over, well, I guess I'm gonna ask Cap for a question. <laughs> Hey guys, thanks for coming out tonight. This is pretty awesome. Sure, thanks for putting on the outfit. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, the Winter Soldier movie by itself was spectacular, obviously. Um, but the beautiful thing about the Marvel Cinematic Universe, of course, is that it's also interconnected between movies and with the TV shows. We are huge Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. fans. And, you know, on Tuesday there was an episode of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., and on Friday, you guys basically destroyed S.H.I.E.L.D. And on Tuesday, there was another episode of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. I've always been really curious about the amount of work and effort that you guys and the people with Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. had to put into making that so seamless. You know, it was, uh, the connection usually comes when a, product, a project is close to being finished. One, because nobody wants the secrets to get out, and this movie had some big secrets. Uh, and two, because it's the easiest time to absorb the, the project, and they're very malleable until you start to get them into a, a, a you know, pretty clear state in, in the post process. Uh, and I, I remember um, uh, the, the, the group from Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. coming over to watch the movie. They had no knowledge of what was in the film up to that point. And this was, I think, while they were working on their, their, their season. And... Um, after they finished the film, they all kind of walked out with very blanched faces. <laughs> and, uh, and then they adjusted, you know, and I think that that's how it works, really. And, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, Doctor Strange is happening right now, and, you know, um, um, we've seen some of the artwork and some of the, uh, the previs and set pieces, uh, and, and, and we've seen the script, but we haven't, you know, we're not... We're not uh, dialed into everything that's happening on that uh, that movie on a on a day to day basis, and you know, we'll we'll see it at some point in the post process when it's the, the easiest to absorb, and then uh, it's you know, much easier to have conversations about it. So, um, it's you know, every everybody is is loosely informed of what's going on everywhere, and you kind of have to be, but not not on, not in a, in a detailed way until the time is right. Question on this side, right there. Ray from San Diego. First of all, that movie, Cut the Check. That was awesome. Uh, second, I want to talk about collaboration. Uh, seeing as you are the caretakers and directors of what are going to be the biggest movies in the Marvel Universe, how do you work with the other directors of the Phase 3 movies, and how has that been? You know, it was, it's kind of like Joe was just describing. We, you know, we, we, we talk to each other. We, but it's important to not, again, every, th every movie is so complex. This is something I really admired about Marvel the second we started to work with them. They're, they're very disciplined about keeping every movie separate to a large degree because they don't want, you know, it's, it's hard to make a good movie. You know, it's, it's, it's a very complicated process, you know, and you can't overly complicate it with, like, all kinds of possibilities that might happen in other movies, you know. So they, they do create a nice space around which all the filmmakers involved in a particular movie work in a vacuum, you know, where they like, they, get, they have the opportunity to sort of dream and figure out what the movie can be unfettered without getting too encumbered by other ideas from other properties. You know, maybe there's one or two key pieces that you have to keep in mind, but they like, they like you to swim in it, they like you to surprise them, they like you to come back at them with things they weren't thinking about. So it's like, they, they, they create a nice little uh, uh, um, space to do that. But then, at, 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 like Joe said, there are key moments, though, where you have to check in with the rest of the MCU, you know? And it's like, usually when, yeah, when there's a script, you know, that everybody believes in. When there's, a, when there's an edit of the film that, you know, most people believe in, you know, whatever the case may be. So you have to have these, these key moments of check-in, but um, it, it's, it's a bit of a dance. It's hard to describe because it's very, it's very complicated and it's sort of uh, made up as, as we go. But it's, it just toggles between going off on your own, having the freedom to sort of take the movie where, where it wants to go, and then also sort of checking back in so that things can find a way to dovetail with each other. Before we get to the next question, you might want to explain what cut the check means. Oh, yeah. 
So cut the check. Anthony Mackey, who's a fabulous actor and a wonderful person, uh, just has this habit. On set. He's a very big set presence. You know, he's the kind of guy like, you know, as soon as he comes on set, you know he's there because you can hear him a hundred yards away. <laughs> but he has a wonderful energy, makes everybody smile. But he has this uh, he has this habit of like when he nails a take, he just screams, "Cut the check!" You know, that's his that's his statement of "I've done it." I, and uh, anyway, it's very infectious. Everybody starts saying it. It's you know. It's a little, little bit of a saying now. When, when he says that on set, are you immediately like, yeah, we're doing another? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes he does it when he's tired and he just doesn't want to do another. Yeah. <laughs> you have to mind him on that. But. Uh, next question, uh, right there. Hi, again, thank you for being here tonight. I had a question. Uh, you mentioned that you collected comic books as a kid, so I'm assuming you're, you've been a fan of this world that you get to play in now for quite a long time. Was there a character, in, now that you're doing Infinity Wars and Civil War, that you were like, yes, I get to direct a scene when this character, because you know Marvel movies are spiraling and there's a lot of different takes, aside from Spidey, but just you know, somebody that didn't show up in Civil War, or somebody who did show up in Civil War, that you well, enjoyed. I mean, it's interesting. Uh, if I th we can't say anybody from Infinity War because that would be a spoiler, right? But I can I can reiterate on the Spider-Man front how excited we were to work with that character, and to bring a vision to that character that you know I've had since I was 11 years old. So uh, you know, we got to bring our our vision to Cap. We. When I read Cap as a kid, I always found I, I was I was less interested in him as a as a character because I didn't find him as complex as I wanted him to be. I, I collected a lot of independent comics as well. I liked darker material, uh, uh, so I always used to imagine Steve McQueen in my head as Cap, and it would just give it a little bit more bite and edge to it. And that's the direction we went in the Winter Soldier. Uh, you know, having having him say lines like, you know, before we get started, does anybody want to get out? It just gives him a little bit more uh, of an edge. Uh, and the movie, cer you know, certainly is about uh, moral complexity, and um, and it tests his character, it tests this sort of, you know, black and white quality that he has, because now he, he no longer lives in a world that's black and white, um, you know. So uh, so we you know that we we spent a lot of time. We wrote a, a, a thirty page thesis for ourselves about Cap and what we what his attribute attributes were, what what his personality traits were, how you know why he felt the way he felt about certain things, how we could modernize him, how we could alter his fighting style, which is really why that boat sequence is at the beginning of the movie, is because it's, uh, it's to illustrate that this isn't, uh, this isn't your dad's Captain America. Um, you know, we, and we took a very similar approach with Spider-Man in Civil War. I have to ask before the next question, all of us are dying to get a look at what Spider-Man's gonna look like in Civil War. So do you guys know, is there like a date circled on a calendar where like Entertainment Weekly is gonna premiere it or you guys are gonna release it online or? What's our release date? Is it like May 6th? Yes. I think May 6th is when you'll find <laughs> it. I mean, the, you know, there's, I, I just wanna mention this about Spider-Man because you know, it's, it, there was a lot of, um, mystery about the character was he in the movie and etc you know so it's sort of it's been a thing but you know part of the part of that came from the fact you know marvel had to, marvel and disney had to make a deal with sony studios in order to use spider-man in the in the mcu it's a very complicated deal between studios and it was you know, we were we were lucky because we were positioned we have a we have a producing deal at sony and we're working with marvel and it's we were kind of well positioned to sort of help uh, reconcile the two studios in terms of what the creative vision for the character would be in the movies and we had, we had good, good, a good co communication line. What's that? They were, they were clapping. Okay. No, I just said thank you. Oh. Thank you. Yeah, but I, I think part of the reason I think it was so secretive and it was, you know, because, you know, our use of the character like the deals were always lagging slightly behind how we were using the character. So we were, you know, we were always in danger of like upsetting the deal if we had talked about, you know, there were still sensitive issues going on between the two studios, studios that they needed to agree on. So, you know, part, when we were casting Tom Holland, when we were screen testing him for the movie, there was a whole very involved process that was kind of under the radar and secretive. Uh, because of the fact that it was still a sensitive business issue. I don't know how so secretive long. it was. It was getting out left I, and right. You know, it was getting out, but it was like we weren't talking about it. We were we were scared to death to talk about it because we didn't want to we didn't want to provoke anybody to like get nervous or anything. Meaning the deal makers. We wanted we wanted just everything to just go through, get done. 
I, the so, so before we get to the question, is there a date on the calendar? Well, I, the reason why I preface that <laughs> like this is because we're, we're still kind of in deal zone, to oh, be honest I with you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, the reason why we still won't talk about stuff like that is because, you know, M Marvel and Sony still haven't worked out, you know, what, what, what uses they have to the character a, on a promotional level, on a commercial level, et cetera. I, so I there's still com complications as far as that goes that they're involved business deals. So that's why we... I, I completely get it. Well, it is interesting that, that the MCU uh, changed their release schedule once all this came about because Spider-Man bumped other things and it's clear that that movie is going to... It's clear there's a very good friendship right now between the studios. Yeah, it's an, ama it's an amazing and a rare thing, so... Yeah. Sure is not Fox. Anyway, uh, on that side, uh, right there. Hi, good night. Thank you once again for being here. As sure, everyone thank has you. Uh, this is more of like a logistical and sanity question uh, for, uh, from a director's standpoint. How do you manage, even though you're, you work together and you talk about collaborations and, and you, we saw the credit roles and it's uh, immense uh, talented people working. How, how do you manage all the logistics of all the departments all the uh, all the companies, uh, set parts, uh, crews. Do you have like a set of assistants or production people that surround you all the time to help you manage all that, and so you keep your sanity and have your like your own life, or you know? Well, that's that's one of the great things about Marvel, and I think why we're we're gonna ultimately spend five or six years of our life there is that uh, it's an incredibly accomplished group of individuals, extremely creative. Uh, very, very hard workers, uh, and 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 pretty phenomenal at what they do, and that's our infrastructure, you know. Uh, and, and and Winter Soldier, we worked hand in hand with Nate Moore, who works for Kevin. Uh, uh, Lou Esposito, who's co-president, handles all the physical production. Um, uh, Victoria, Victoria uh, uh, manages uh, all the VFX and post. Um, you know, we have a, we have a VFX, uh, Dan DeLuvi is our VFX supervisor, uh, who handles all the effects for us. We have a, a <coughs> massive pre team. We have storyboard artists. Yes, we have assistants who work with us. One of them who's standing right there, Andrew, say hello to everybody. Uh, we have a, we have a great AD, um, you know, uh, on uh, Infinity War, we have Jer Jeremy Latcham, who's also a producer at Marvel, who works for Kevin. Who, who made the last two Avengers movies is going to be working with us. And uh, so it's just an incredibly uh, um, uh, solid infrastructure, uh, and you're really, really well supported. Uh, and it makes um, executing your vision uh, um, uh, very healthy and uh, much easier than, than a lot of other places. Thank you. This, this Feige guy is pretty good. He's, he's, he's really fucking good. Yeah. Par pardon my language. I, th I think the kid went to the bathroom. We're good. Uh, but he'll be back. Be careful. Uh, I'll go right there. Hey, guys. My name's CJ. Really appreciate all your work from Community, Aggressive Development, and the MCU. I just wonder, as you guys are getting a little bit more into the cosmic universe with Avengers Infinity War, how is your mindset kind of shifting from something that's more Earth-based with Captain America to something that's going to be Thanos, Doctor Strange, basically the whole MCU? I'm just curious yeah it's you know just to give you the pre you know, look we, we would be measured very measured in the answer because it's we're still forming that number one and number two again we you know it's like we don't it's very premature to start getting into details for spoilers and stuff like that but um yeah we look we're definitely moving into a more fantasy realm and then again it's it's kind of like the same thing we like we're grateful for that because it's like again we're, we're really happy with the fact that Winter Soldier worked as a movie. It was a very specific idea we had for that movie, a very specific tone and style. And then, you know, again, we, like we wanted to figure out how do we evolve that in the Civil War? How do we push ourselves into new territory? And moving into the cosmic realm is a great, great boon for us because, again, it pushes us into a completely new space creatively um, from where we've been playing with these two movies. So um, we're just... I mean, it's it's hard again. It's like hard to get too detailed about it at this point. But it's it's it's. Um, I'll just say this. I mean, look, and, it, and it, it's, it touches on what we talked about with the cameras. I mean, we're going, we're using a completely different frame. The IMAX frame is radically different. Um, it it sort of gives you that sort of vast space up and down, which you know 
for us, it's like when you're dealing with a character that's the size of Thanos, you know, it's like you, you, you're just playing, you're dealing with the vertical and the frame more than the horizontal in a lot of ways. So um, it's all kind of, it's all stuff like that involved in that. But um, you have some. You, you know, it's, uh, there's a naturalism in this movie. That's the, that was the approach we wanted to take with Cap. There, we were going to bring a naturalism to the cosmic side as well, as best as we can, and a psychological realism, you know. Uh, you're dealing with fantastical elements, but you can still make them feel um, uh, very human and very intimate. Uh, and that's, that's the important part, and, you know, um, uh, I think... Um, you know, that's, that's going to be our approach with the cosmic realm. Um, you know, we need really, really strong and interesting and inventive visuals, but at the same time, we need these characters to be as real and honest and, and feel as psychologically real as possible. Uh, this side, right there. After watching it again, was there anything about the movie that you hated or made you wince when you saw it again? I can't, I can't answer that question. I'm too embarrassed. <laughs> I think, you know, we worked really hard to try and airtight the uh, logic of the, of, the, of the movie because it is a mystery. But the, I think the biggest buy in the film is when Fury's in his flipped over SUV and the Winter Soldier's walking at him and he rips the door off and there's this hole cut through the concrete and he's kind of disappeared into the sewers below the city. I, you know... We used to joke while we were working on it in VFX that he used his lightsaber <laughs> to get out of there. And really, at the end of the day, you go, it's S.H.I.E.L.D. He has a, he has a thing. <laughs> it, cut, it cuts its way through metal and concrete. What do you want? Uh, you know, and then we call it back later in the movie. I'm not sure how they, you know, their vehicle was in the middle of all the other vehicles, and they cut their way through. The, I'm not sure how they got out. <laughs> without being seen. So there's little things like that, you know. We can honest trailer our own movie. If I'm not mistaken, uh, there is an Easter egg that probably a lot of people don't notice in the cemetery. Uh, do we all know the Easter egg? We're... Okay. Well, then I don't have to say it. That was just where you say, again, you sit in these rooms for a very long time when you're working on VFX, and that's where you get to... That's the hardest part of the movie, I'll be honest, is because you can get a room at like 9 a.m. and leave at 6 p.m. and all you've done all day is stare at shots and you have a little laser pointer and you go, I don't know if the light looks real on the side of that uh, Quinjet, you know. And then uh, you cut it in the movie and it's actually six frames of a shot and you're like, oh, geez, what are we doing? Uh, just finished the shot. Uh, but we were sitting in one of those rooms and we were trying to figure out what was on the gravestone and sometimes these conversations are endless, you know. Uh, it's a shot that goes by for three seconds and then it's over, but we may have had a five-hour argument about what goes on the gravestone. <laughs> and the aunt finally was like, you know, why don't we just do an Easter egg uh, uh, to Pulp Fiction? And, uh, and so we put the quote on there. So that's how that stuff comes about. Some of the, some of the Easter eggs are pre-planned. Some of them we make up while we're on set. Sometimes the prop guy, uh, he had an, uh, you know, we're shooting the scene with, uh, with Redford when he's in the kitchen and he opens it up to get some milk if you look real hard, there's a little Newman's own uh, salad dressing in there. And on like take two, I was like, is that Newman's <laughs> own salad? And then the, you know, we found out the prop department had put it in there. So everybody's always working to do little, to have fun with the movie and, and uh, uh, you know, give you, give you some, some uh, extra things to look for on DVD. I didn't, I didn't know that Newman's own thing. Uh, on this side, uh, we'll, we'll go right here first. Uh, well, my question is, uh, now that you've handled Captain America, you're going into the Avengers. Uh, if there's an opportunity, do you think you would take it to fix the Fantastic Four? <laughs> <laughs> that didn't come from me. Because nobody gotten it right. <laughs> but you wouldn't be able to use Chris, because he already played the Human Torch. We have to pass on that question. <laughs> That's a hot potato. <laughs> I'll say, because they can't, it really sucks that Fox and Marvel are not friends. And I believe, as we all know, it's quite contentious. And uh, I don't see that uh, bridge forming anytime soon. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a, you know, it's hard with the, you know, it's, it, the heartbreaker about the, the rights issues are, you know, 
you know, a lot of the people who are in the decision-making position about how, whether or not they're going to make these huge finance, like these, these deals are worth so much money now. Sure. Like this property is worth so much money. So a lot of the decision-makers are just like hardcore numbers people who like don't really have a passion for the material. They have a passion for the money. And so they'll like, they'll hold up, but you know, they'll put the gun to the head of a, of a, you know, something that people in this room or we all care something, care a whole lot about because they don't really have that same attachment. That's the real tragedy of it. It's like, you know, that there's, you know, there's people with only financial incentives that get in the way of like a lot of creative fun that we all could be having. So, but you yeah. can't really do anything about that. I think that down the road at some point, uh, I would like to think that everyone is going to get along, but you know, they're so successful with the X-Men movies and yeah. you know, they're, they're making, some of them are quite good uh, over at Fox and I, I've heard Deadpool is quite good and you know, the new X, but anyway, the point is it sucks. Yeah. It just sucks. I'm, I'm off on a tangent, I'm sorry. Um, right over there. I wondered if you would talk a little bit about the music. I think uh, Winter Soldier had such an amazing um, variety of music. You call back to the 40s, you've got Caps theme, and then um, I was really impressed with the music for the Winter Soldier. I'm wondering um, how much of that is, is your directing or giving um, Henry Jackman sort of an idea of where you want to go, and um, how much is, is sort of him seeing the movie and having a vision of it himself. Well, we'll say right up front, Henry Jackman is a genius. And he makes, uh, makes it very, very easy to work with him uh, because the music is so good. And he just, he just did some, we just saw some score today on Civil War that just blew our minds. We just, we love this guy. Uh, but we have very similar tastes. We like expressionism. Uh, we like music that uh, underscores emotionality. Uh, so usually what we'll do as a process is we will sit with him for an hour or two um, uh, when, we're, when, when we're getting ready to go to shoot. Once the script is done and everybody's happy, he reads the script and we get together and we just talk about what we're trying to accomplish with the movie from a tonal standpoint, because music, more than anything, affects tone. Um, and uh, and what, what, we're, what, what we want out of the character arcs and what, you know, so we'll talk about themes for each character and, and, uh, and how we can underscore that through music. Uh, and then Henry will go to work and usually the way he composes is he'll compose like a suite for the movie, the theme of the film, the composer suite, that's a Captain America adventure suite. So it's usually six, seven, eight minutes of music and it's not scored to anything, but we, we sit and we listen to it and you, you, you know, you can feel where parts of that music will go in the film, but we find that it's better to not put it to picture because it, it lives better and it breathes better and he can go different places with the music that he wouldn't if he were trying to score it to picture. And then, you know, when you do needle drops and things like that, you're just looking by that, I mean like the 40s music or, uh, you know, Cap's apartment. Uh, it's, um, it's really just what is the, what, what do you want out of that, uh, that, that, what feeling do you want out of that moment in the, in the movie? And, um, you know, from a process standpoint too, I remember when we were working on the, the end of the film, you know, we kept uh, saying to Henry, we really want it to be very emotional when Cap falls out of the helicarrier. Uh, when Bucky saves him, and he had he had scored a really beautiful piece there. It's the theme that you hear, but we're sitting there and, and watching it and going, it might be too big for what the moment is. And I said, can you just play it on a piano? And he literally got up, walked over there. We played the picture, and he played he played that final piece on the piano, and we and you know we all went, oh my God, that's so it's so tragic to watch, uh, uh, you know, Bucky pull him from the water and walk away. And so that, that's really what the process is like sometimes. It's, it's a lot of give and take, and, and there's a lot of collaboration, but you know, he, uh, he, he really makes the job easy. I just I want to add a couple things just because Henry is such an amazing guy. I mean, he has a very, he has an extremely sophisticated sense of story and character. Like that, like, so I have to say, like some, some of the, like, uh, you, just talking to Henry about the movie like helps the movie get better. It helps Joe and I sort of think about the movie in a better way, think about the characters in a better, better way. He's really in tune to very subtle, a very subtle sense of character and a subtle sense of psychology and tone. He's very, very sophisticated on that level and it helps a lot. And then, you know, just for that signature Winter Soldier sound that he came up for in this movie that we love so much that, you know, he... Re he recorded a human voice and he started bending it around so it sort of sounds like mus a musical instrument and it was just, you know, we had talked to him about coming up with like a signature sound for the Winter Soldier and talking to him about like the psychological state of the Winter Soldier and the sort of sense of schism in there and 
and um, you know the fact that he would like he came up with this crazy idea of this human voice just screeching, and it's just for it to be so cool and distinctive and and sort of there's a sense of vulnerability in there too. I mean, it's a really brilliant piece of music, and it, it's like it just it colors that character in such a wonderful way. And he was just saying the other day. Uh, we were just talking, and he goes, I remember the first time I played that for you guys. And I was thinking to myself, ah, oh, this is either going to be a great freaking idea, or you're just going to look at me with like blank faces, and I'll just go back to the studio. But it's like, you know, that, that you want somebody to take big swings. Like, I mean, that's the thing we try to encourage in all our, of our collaborators, is we like to give people a safe space to take big swings and do interesting work and take risks and sort of, and have room to fail. You know, cre keep, keep that space in the process to fail and mess up and have bad ideas that we all need to rethink, you know, and for ourselves as well. So, um, but anyway, Henry's like the epitome of, uh, of that kind of collaborator. Uh, let's do one more question, but before you raise your hand, a good one. Does someone feel like we haven't hit one thing yet that they really want to cover? Anybody? Does anyone want to take that bite? <laughs> we have someone here. Anybody else? And we're going, wait. The, I think, no, I, wait, hold on. So, to your right. Wait, where am I? Right there. I was wondering if you guys were ever going to do anything with Serpent Society. Well, we did for a minute there, right? <laughs> uh, I, you know, I don't know. Who knows? You, can, like, you never know with Marvel. Uh, if, if I tell you we are going to do something with Serpent so Society, it would be a big spoiler. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I'll tell you this. By the time you get through Infinity War, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know if there's going to be anything left you're asking us for. <laughs> <laughs> um, on that note, uh, I really want to, I mean, I could ask more questions, but I know everyone wants to pictures or signatures or whatever. So why don't we all give a round of thanks. He told me not to trust anyone. This is how it ends. Everything goes. Like you're giving the orders now, Captain. Damn right.